started to erupt. Sorry about that, Al. Oh, go ahead. No, it's the cat. Get away. Damn cat. I don't... Wow. I don't know why this is so much wonky. Hey, folks, it's Grimwit. I'm playing Casual Truck. With me today is Al. Hey, say hello, Al. How's it going, people? And, uh... I don't know what I'm doing, or where I'm going, or why I'm going there, and I think that's the best way to do it. I don't have any cargo. I think my thing is alright. I got almost 3,000 euros, I mean English pounds, because euros are filthy, filthy currency. Yeah. And uh, today's question is, what is today's question? Well, what are the ore prices in Ergun? Ergune. 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 There are no silent E's in, in Kaidan. I don't know if that's true, but it is to me. <laughs> uh, the ore prices in Ergune is like 46 per unit, which is crazy high. I'm not paying that. There was a recent update. I hadn't played for a while, and now there's apparently bidding. It's a random travel event, and I believe it's when another merchant dies, you're willing to bid on his wares. He's not... You say I, oh, is he ahead. dying? Is he dying? Is that what happened? I thought he just, like, couldn't get rid of his stuff. Uh, I did kind of skim over the text. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not gonna lie to you there, I just assume he's dead. <laughs> I mean, I could pull it up if you want me to start playing well, Kai like, Dan. Well, like, who's who's the money going to? Anyway, I, I need, like, a quick episode, because my Merchants of Kai Dan videos that I've done already... That, I, I recorded a ton of it, and it took that long to edit it together. Ah, my car. And uh, once I was done, I was like, I've only got two episodes worth of stuff, and I've got a comic to run. I can't do this, because tomorrow, Friday, because this is being recorded on Thursday, tomorrow's my usual day for recording and editing and everything. So, I, l let's drive, l let's talk. We've got like 28 minutes, go. Um, t tell me, how is the weather in Nebraska? Um, I don't know how, what it's like in Nebraska, but in Ohio, it's pretty damn chilly. Uh, we're supposed to get down to negative one tonight, which, uh, for I suppose a buddy of mine, Rebel Stoke Jim, isn't abnormal. But it, uh, it's just harsh around here. That Give is, me a day off, though. That is so fascinating. I'm just gonna listen. How much snowfall have you gotten? No snowfall. Really? This is the cutting edge podcast esque casual truck we're doing here. The weather. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> what um, is wrong with me? I am so lost. Like, I did not plan this at all, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Oh, come on. We can do this. Quick, tell me about greed. <laughs> oh! Greed. Um, I don't know. Greed is good. Greed is I, not I, good. I, I think dr greed drives uh, natural selection. I think capitalism is the closest thing to Darwinism we can get socially, and that uh, greed has its own consequences, which pay for itself. Greed and does not mean capitalism. I agree. However, the two... One comes with the other. Not necessarily, because greed can really break capitalism, and has. I mean, just look at yeah. the bailouts. That yeah. was socialism. That was pure socialism. And we masked it since it had capital in its story, since it had to do with money, then people just assumed it was about capitalism. But it's not. Cap capitalism would have been allowing those guys to die just allowing the banks to fall apart well i should step back greed i think is a human trait but then again so are governments and the two are therefore inseparable that's uh, up to debate look at bees they have a government they do have a government but they don't have greed but they're not working for the same goals we are they're not individuals one could argue that the mind is the hive itself, that one individual is not representative of the actual species. Whereas one individual human can be 
much more representative of the species. Not totally, but uh, cover a wider array of functionality. Right, a macro organism, one that instead of having individual cells, you have individual units like yeah. ants. Ants and is, one colony of ants is like one large organism. I was first introduced to that idea through Ender's Game. Because that's how the aliens worked. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's how uh, aliens work in Aliens. What, you mean like the xenomorphs? Yeah. Really? What? No way. What? Yeah, they function like a hive with a queen. Huh. Let's Granted, see. that that's not necessarily what H.R. Giger originally proposed. There are alternate scenes in the original Alien in which a single xenomorph can begin producing eggs. However, uh, oh, what's his name? James Cameron, when he took over the franchise, kind of stepped away from what Giger originally proposed and kind of made his own stamp on it that there would be a queen devoted to laying eggs with control over the other xenomorphs. Cameron. No, I don't even know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't... Let's see. What else is Grant? Didn't, isn't he the guy who did Avatar? He is. He All is. right. I know him. He makes effective films. Yes. Uh, the Abyss was excellent. Terminator 2 is still one of the single best films ever made, I think. Uh, does it have Lopan in it? It does not have low pan. Then it is going to have to resign itself to second place. Oh yeah, I uh, <laughs> top ten though. I'll give it top ten. <laughs> I uh, I saw Terminator Two and I thought it was effective. Notice mm -hmm. I'm not saying good. Cameron makes well designed films. He does. I don't remember them after I watched them. Ever. A actually, the design of Terminator Two in all of its complexity is very fascinating. I've watched a lot of the, uh, all the director's cuts and the uh, commentaries for that movie. Special scenes, deleted scenes. Wow, you're really into not... Terminator 2. I only um, remember one thing from the movie, and uh, other than the T, what is it, the T-1000? The melty guy? Other than <laughs> that, I guess I also remember the thumbs up while he, while uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is sinking into molten lead. Or yeah, and those That's are the only actually... two scenes that those are the only two scenes that stuck with me. The rest of it is just like, yes, they are moving in a straight line towards some kind of goal or away from another kind of goal, and uh, they, there is movement here. There's a lot of action and movement, not a lot of emotional involvement, but that's okay because that's not what I tuned into this movie for. You know how they pulled off the molten uh, steel. How, how, oh, the special effects? Was that not uh, a kind of CGI? Um, for the actual T-1000, as he was melting, yes, but for Arnold Schwarzenegger, only the fire was added because it was just a big pool of KY jelly backlit with uh, pool lights. That's actually really awesome. Like I said, Cameron makes some effective films. Yeah, there's, there's one scene in particular that was cut out in which... Uh, the Terminator Sarah Connor and John Connor were talking about how the Terminator works. This is uh, before Sarah trusted the machine. And in it, they talked about how each individual Terminator is a learning machine. However, when it's sent out for individual missions, its learning capabilities are turned off. So, John decides to perform brain surgery on the Terminator to turn his machine, uh, to turn his learning function back on. And they set up an elaborate scene in which they set up a glass plate, a mock-up of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and the actual Arnold Schwarzenegger. In front of you was the view from the back of them tearing open, uh, tearing open his head, which was the dummy. And they actually went so far as to get Linda Hamilton's twin to coordinate and mirror her every movement so, so her and her twin could be their own reflection in the scene. That's cool. I'm hunting down this green car in front of me, and I'm going to tell you whenever I finally hit his backside. I've oh, been, fuck him up. 
I've been chasing him for the last so many miles, and I've been matching his speed. He's just barely not fast enough. But he did make me crash, and now I'm madder at him. Are you hauling liquid nitrogen? Okay, that would there be we go. very apropos. Now, I just hit him. I'm going to the photo studio. And let's see here. That's a nice-ish shot. Not as good a kill as I want. Let me get a close-up of this fucker's face. Oh, man. He's got... I'm sorry. He's got a pedo stash. Uh-oh. Yeah. Let's... There we go. Let's straighten that out so he looks straight. And let's lower that there. There we go. And there you go. You got a globe trotter up your ass. And there we go. Excellent. Give him half him another second. And let's get another shot of this asshole. You'll have to excuse me. This will... You'll see this. Oh my god. I am wearing his car as a hood. Oh boy. You ruined that guy's day. I, I certainly hope so. Although he still does not look like it. He still looks like a pedo to me. So. Did you ever... Did you ever watch Reboot? Oh, yeah. Incoming now, game. Yeah, uh, apply that to what's going on in your game right now. <laughs> oh. What? The oh, one what? He's just stuck. He's stuck on my... On the front of my car. Okay, finally, I got him scraped off. And I suffered minimal damage. Excellent. So, uh... So who are we talking about? Is it, uh... Okay, let me remember all the characters' names, because it's been a while. I remember Enzo. I remember badass Enzo from the 90s, which is what his name was when I when I last saw him. Bob. The original. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Dot. Hexadecimal. I had the biggest crush on Hexadecimal, because at the time, I didn't know the rule that you don't stick your dick in crazy. Okay. <laughs> She was the right kind of crazy, though. That, oh, man, yeah. Now, it did skew my <laughs> understanding of computers as the as the function of the universe. If you win a game on your own computer, you destroy some critical part of the hard drive. I don't... Well, I kind of knew that they were full of it, but I still liked the idea. That wasn't the only... I have played games where the point of the game is to be part of the computer and rescue part of the computer. Like for uh, a long time ago, there used to be a puzzle game for the Macintosh called Three in Three. That's the word three, or the, the, the number three inside the word three. Okay. And uh, another one was by the same guy where instead of health, you had RAM and you were constantly trying to get more RAM. So, before I saw Reboot, I, I got in into that mindset before. But, oh man, still, so good. Oh yeah, an amazing show. <laughs> I, I even internet. liked it when it went weird at the tor towards the last couple of seasons. Yeah, the internet uh, being some deep space where you can ride leviathans, and there were just men who spoke in uh, dial tone. Yeah. yeah. It was really good. It was really good. They really made that into something special. The, uh... I, I liked... I'll be honest, I liked Enzo better after the, uh, after the time he spent in all of those games. Just years and years in games. So, of course, he's like this grizzled mess. But I liked him better because he wasn't annoying afterwards. Right. That, that was the thing about Enzo. Is he always... He really bothered me how supremely naive he was and just how... I, I, I just hated him. And then well, he changed. And I'm like, all right, I played Cyberpunk 2020. I can get into this guy now. Can, can consider his backstory. I mean... Other than his sister, Bob was the only other sprite that he 
could really interact with. They had all the other little gizmos and gadgets that ran around, but all the other sprites were destroyed in some tragic event that happened before. I thought those so were he, bits. The, 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 either the rectangles or, or circles, they were ones and zeros. Yeah, they, uh, the exact uh, ecology of Reboot escapes me at the moment, but I, he was an annoying character. But it was kind of justified in the fact that he is overzealous and over the moon of the only other thing other than his sister that he can really appreciate and interact with and be a peer with. Are we talking about the mermaid girl thing? That was later. Bob was the Bob was his big. Oh, like, okay. Uh, you know, I keep on. Uh, you're right. You're right. Dot is Enzo's sister. For some reason, I keep thinking of her as his mother because that's honestly how she acts. Yeah, pretty much. I love the slow diner. <laughs> oh man, so many memories. Did you ever play the video game for the PS1? No, sir. Holy crap, I didn't even know one existed. Uh, I don't know where this road takes me, so let's take it. Let's go to victory. It is 8 o'clock at night, in-game time, and by the time I'm done with this drive, uh, it'll probably be past midnight. Just letting you, letting you guys know. Ooh, ooh, a game I need to play. A game I need to find, like, buy, I should say. Have you ever heard of Glitch Hikers? No. All right, I was introduced to this game, um, through a review by Errant Signal, who's a guy who does video reviews and general philosophy of gaming, etc. And uh, I'll leave a link in the description. Errant Signal's really cool. In any case, he, he came across a game called Glitch Hikers, which is an indie game, and it's very David Lynch. There's a lot of Lost Highway feel to the game. The idea is you're driving at night, you might be going someplace, it doesn't actually matter and you pass somebody on the road and when you look over they're in your car and you have a discussion and okay. the, and the discussion is david lynch-esque surrealism it's that kind of thing i want to get in I, like i want to get that game i want to do a video and i want like because oh god it's just i love the concept it's one of the reasons i like euro truckers this the the feeling of driving at night looking over and seeing the man in the moon and just the rain comes down you're all alone there's nothing else going on except for maybe the sound of the radio yeah i've made drives like that they're they're kind of fun but when you start to see shit that isn't there is a pretty bad way to drive <laughs> every well everybody's had that kind of sensation anybody who's driven at night through the back roads of middle america like driving in Colorado where the land is so flat you can the, the horizon bends in front of you and you just have a road that goes on forever mm -hmm. off endless into, infinity yeah it just there's a vanishing point to the road that you're driving on oh man I just ran over that sign oh well he won't, he won't. Yeah. or being out on the ocean I've, I've never done that. I've always wanted to be on the ocean, but I, I just haven't done it. I, they... um, I've been out uh, on the Gulf of Mexico once, and we didn't get very far because a water spout came in. But, like, you can put yourself... You, you live pretty near the ocean. You can kind of put yourself in that mindset if you face out. Yeah, kind of. The problem was that when I went to... The ocean. The only time I've ever ever seen the ocean was uh, my parent-in-laws decided the best way to do it was to take me to Ocean City. Ocean mm -hmm. City is a carnival. It is not the ocean. Although I will say that the ocean chewed me up and spit me back out and was, took pity on me by letting me keep my shorts on. <laughs> yeah, ocean ocean kicked my ass. Ocean kicked my ass pretty bad. <laughs> they thought oh, it was mistress. It is. <laughs> Everybody else thought it was funny, and I'm just like, well, I'm, gl I'm glad you guys, you know, are happy, because I just got my ass kicked. Where are my glasses? Oh, thank God. <laughs> Actually, I think I was smart enough to give people my glasses. Anyway. But yeah, um, it, that feeling of just complete 
loneliness, isolation, driving through the woods of Oklahoma on a back road, there's no street lights around you, there's no nothing, and you got just white noise on the outside. Just, mm -hmm. just give it a second of silence. Oh, uh, what's especially terrifying is driving through the hills of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. You, you get, or even down into North Carolina when you're down in Appalachian country, and you know that there's nothing for 50 miles, and the hike is up and down a frickin' mountain. And if you crash, you're going off the side of that mountain. Yeah, I love that feeling, which is why I was wanted uh, wanting glitch hikers. There we go, wrong way down a one-way street. Stopped by a cop driving backwards down a one-way street. He opened up the door, saw her, her and punched her in the teeth. So, uh, do you have any sort of, uh, reaction to Jon Stewart announcing that he's leaving The Daily Show? I knew it was coming. We all knew it was coming. I am not surprised, only because last year he said he was thinking about it, and I'm like, okay, I guess I gotta prepare. It won't be the same. See, he wasn't just the anchor. He was the director. Yeah. And it, it won't be the same. I, He'll be missed. He'll be back. <laughs> it, they're still retaining all of their writers, though. And not to say that Jon Stewart doesn't have a, ver uh, have a very big impact on that. But, uh, well, you'll notice that they've been trying little things. I think the real wit of the show is going to be. Maybe. See, they've been trying little things, I've noticed. For example, John Oliver taking over for like a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they know that if they get the right personality, that's really all you need. Well, they didn't try that necessarily uh, just as an experiment. Jon Stewart left to make a movie. Which movie? Uh, ooh, uh, Rosewater. And it's a documentary about Iran. However, I don't know much more than that. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's actually won a couple of awards already. Let, here, let me do a Google search. Eh, don't don't bother. We're coming towards the end. Ah, it's about um, 22 minutes we've been recording, and it's, we're getting close to the point where we need to wrap this up. But uh, I, I'll have to look it up on my own. I, w I want to start a betting pool for uh, his first replacement because I think they're going to go through a couple. You think? Yeah. Um, my money is that they're going to put, uh, oh, what's his name? The host of Talking Dead. Chris Hardwick. Yeah, I think they're going to, uh, they're going to pop him in there. And if they're, uh, if they're ballsy, they may even put, uh, Daniel Tosh in that seat. I, okay, you will not see Daniel Tosh in there. He doesn't have... He, he simply does. He, he simply isn't reliable enough to pull it off. Hardwick, I could kind of see, but Hardwick is so busy. Like that man is a workhorse. He is, but it is a golden opportunity that I don't know that he wouldn't pass up. I don't. I don't know. He's so dedicated to that kind of nerdcore mentality. There we go. I have parked myself behind an abandoned building. It is time to go ahead and shack up. I think we're going to go ahead and stop here. Al, it was always a pleasure, and I guess we'll continue talking about whatever in the next show. Maybe even next week. I don't know. Depends on how good my editing for Kaidan is. How, uh, who do you think they're going to replace him with? Uh, well, considering that we need to wrap this up, I'm going to say Donald Duck. Ah, okay. A 3D rendering of Donald Duck with the cheesiest CGI that you can only get from children's networks. Sounds legit. All right, man. Well, say goodnight, Al. Good night. And I will see everybody else whenever I see everybody else. Okay, I'm recording. And shout it out, brother.
Uh, shout out to Johnny White Trash, Miranda Janelle, and That Fracking Cat, all of which on Twitter, uh, at Team White Trash, at Miranda Janelle, and at That Fracking Cat, just like it sounds. Uh, I want to know what you guys think Comedy Central is going to do in replacing Jon Stewart. Links in the description, guys. <laughs>